She'll move on. I'll call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, closing the GAP ministerial statement consideration. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I move that the Senate take note of the documents relating to the closing of the GAP ministerial statement. Mr. President, I rise today to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of our country. We pay our respects to the Ngunnawal people and all First Peoples and to their elders, past, present and emerging. I acknowledge Indigenous Australians serving our country in a wide range of fields today, in our Australian Defence Force, protecting Australians and advancing our interests. At this time of global challenge in this global pandemic, I acknowledge those Indigenous Australians serving in the front line of our medical professions and other fields of endeavour, keeping Australians safe and helping our nation through tough times. I also honour the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who serve in this parliament across both of our chambers. The Minister for Indigenous Australians, the Shadow Minister for Indigenous Australians, Senators Dodson, McCarthy, Lambie and Thorpe. We look forward to their numbers growing. As the Prime Minister has reflected upon in the other place, at the core of closing the gap is ensuring that every Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, boy or girl, can grow up with the same opportunities and the same expectations as any other Australian child. They should have every opportunity to grow up proud of their culture and confident that it is accorded respect by their fellow Australians. Thirteen years ago, the parliament rightly apologised to the stolen generations. As a new member of this parliament, I remember it as a significant moment of great reckoning and a vital step towards reconciliation. As the Prime Minister said, in the nine years that have followed, the closing the gap process, whilst with the best of intentions at heart, has at times remained hard of hearing. We still thought we knew better. That is why our government brought together a new 10-year national partnership agreement signed by all Australian governments, the Coalition of the Peaks and the Australian Local Government Association. From that partnership, the national agreement on closing the gap was born. Last Thursday, we made the promises of that agreement real, with the presentation as tabled of the first Commonwealth Implementation Plan. This agreement holds the financial commitments, partnership, shared accountability and scope that forms the most significant and comprehensive response to closing the, closing the gap that our government has ever provided. With this implementation plan, we are making good on our commitment to do things differently, focusing on listening, learning, accountability, transparency and a genuine partnership with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander stakeholders and organisations, a partnership built on mutual respect, dignity and, above all, trust. At the heart of the national agreement is who it empowers and what it inspires. In a significant departure from what we've done before, each of the states and territories and the Coalition of the Peaks will be responsible for their own actions and their own plans. An annual Commonwealth Progress Report will be tabled around this same time every year. Similarly, the states and territories will separately deliver theirs, and all of us will reprioritise our investments to do things that we know are and will work. To help us understand what the evidence says and our progress, the Productivity Commission will release an annual report on the outcomes and priority reforms. As well as the annual reports, the Productivity Commission will also present an independent review once every three years. After each report by the Productivity Commission, an independent Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander report will deepen the data and give us a picture of the change happening on the ground. The first Commonwealth implementation plan, with more than $1 billion worth of new targeted measures, lays the foundation for the work ahead. The plan is an overview of Commonwealth actions to close the gap, aligned to the four priority reforms and the 17 socio-economic outcomes set in the national agreement, including new target areas such as justice and Indigenous languages. The measures we're funding reflect a sharpened set of priorities, 
and these are priorities that have been offered and agreed by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples themselves. The first of these new priorities is to collaborate better by building better structures for genuine partnership and joint decision making. The second priority is to build up Indigenous organisations to empower community controlled sectors to do what they already do best, deliver the services that support closing the gap. Included in this implementation plan is $38.6 million for an outcomes and evidence fund. It will support genuine co-design between government and Aboriginal controlled organisations and other local providers to deliver the best possible services for families and children. Our third priority area is about transforming government to help us to understand in detail how our systems can knowingly or otherwise perpetuate racism so as to ensure we can overcome it. We won't be able to close the gap without doing so. The last priority area reform is about data. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations need to be able to collect, analyse and use their own data to meet their own needs. In this new plan, one measure has meant perhaps more than many others. That relates to the stolen generations, a shameful chapter in our national story. Last week, the Prime Minister announced that the Commonwealth is investing $378.6 million in a new scheme for the stolen generations for survivors who were removed as children from their families in former Commonwealth territories, the Northern Territory, the Jarvis Bay Territory and here in the ACT. A long called for step, recognising the bond between healing, dignity and the health and well-being of members of the stolen generations, their families and their communities to say formally not just that we're deeply sorry for what happened, but that we will take responsibility for it. Other aspects of the Commonwealth Implementation Plan include tangible actions that are directly linked to clear targets that will be held accountable for in the years ahead. Measures that are new in the priority reform areas of justice and languages, and measures that need continuing investment to deliver a longer-term impact. The Commonwealth is providing an extra $254.4 million towards infrastructure to better support Aboriginal community-controlled health organisations to do their critical work. The plan, as I've said, also has a new focus on justice and bringing people together in a justice policy partnership to meet new targets, that by 2031 we will reduce the rate of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander adults incarcerated by at least 15% and the rate of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people in detention by at least 30 per cent. To help get to this target, the government is investing $9.3 million to support Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services to better manage complex cases in coronial inquiries. There is also $8.2 million for family dispute resolution programs for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families. We have also set a target to see a steady increase in the number and strength of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander languages being spoken between now and 2031, and that is why we're committing $22.8 million to support this effort. To ensure the best start in life for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, the Commonwealth is investing more than $160 million, including $122.6 million to lift participation in quality and culturally appropriate early childhood education and care. In school education, we are investing $75 million to support building on-country boarding schools, $26 million for city-country school partnerships and $25 million to make sure primary school kids are taught using the best evidence-based programs. To keep women and children safe, the plan is also investing in supporting Indigenous families with complex needs. These specific programs and payments are in addition uh, to the many other streams of funding, programs and support, uh, often targeted such as school-based funding, to provide real focus and assistance to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities in lifting and improving outcomes. We cannot expect to see clear improvements overnight, but we believe the approach we are taking now gives us the best chance. This Commonwealth implementation plan and the proposals in it forms one part of a larger whole. There are 10 implementation plans like it 
one for each jurisdiction, the Peaks and the Australian Local Government Association. And all of them will be tracked and further shaped as we learn more about what is working and what needs to improve. The Indigenous Voice co-design process final report has also been submitted, following 18 months of extensive engagement and co-design. We will further consider the details of the final report and respond in the future following consideration by the Cabinet. An Indigenous Voice can add to the many other efforts being made to achieve the closing the gap outcomes by providing further avenues at the national, local and regional level for Indigenous voices to be heard, including to provide feedback to government on closing the gap. Once a model for the Indigenous voice has been developed, all governments will need to explore how we can work with the voice to ensure that these views are considered. Whilst we know these outcomes won't happen overnight, we are working together, right now, continuously, with the Coalition of the Peaks, alongside the states and territories and local governments, to navigate the road ahead. We know that there are many years of hard work ahead for all of us, as we have tough years behind us. We have to learn from each other, and we will together do so. And in doing so, with this new approach, we should have confidence that step by step, we can, as a country, make the differences that are necessary for all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and peoples. I thank the Senate. Hey. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. And I begin by acknowledging that we meet on the land of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, land that was never ceded. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And I also pay tribute to Minister Wyatt, Ms. Burney, Senator Dodson, Senator McCarthy, Senator Lambie and Senator Thorpe. I'm privileged to count Linda, Pat and Malandiri as friends and to have learnt so much from them. Over the past month, our nation has celebrated the talent, hard work, integrity and achievement of Australian athletes. Few have inspired us more than Ash Barty, winning Wimbledon and a bronze medal in Tokyo, and Paddy Mills who led the Boomers to Australia's first ever Olympic men's basketball medal. Their pride as representatives of Australia as obvious as their pride in their Aboriginal heritage. Their sporting heritage, their stated love and respect for Yvonne Gulagong Corley and Cathy Freeman. And their cultural heritage as traditional custodians of the land we now call Australia, inheritors of the oldest continuing civilisation on earth. Being proud of who they are, claiming their space, not seeking to accommodate anyone's discomfort. And I make these observations not to pretend sport can close the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. It can't. And we need to be careful in thinking sport can overcome racism on its own, just as we need to be careful not to promote an expectation that to be valued in our society, Indigenous Australians need to be Olympians. Because what then happens to the little Indigenous kid who isn't a star athlete? What happens when Indigenous athletes don't want to be boxed in and express views that some don't like? But there is something happening in sport. We see athletes of all races the world over taking the knee together, conveying to each other and their fans that black lives matter. People who might not have come together in other circumstances, finding themselves on the same team, relying on each other, each person engaging in an act of respect and in an act of leadership. Old expectations of racial solidarity would not have brooked that. Now the message many are sending, sending we are a team, we stand together. An attack on one of us because of our race is an attack on all of us, on all of our shared humanity. We see it here in Australia, in the respect and affection of the boomers for their captain, in how the AFL is seeking to improve its response to acts of racism. It is heartbreaking and unacceptable that we see overt acts of racial abuse in Australian sport, just as it is heartbreaking and unacceptable that structural racism is still so persistent. A critical part of overcoming racial abuse and structural racism is action. In just one example, in my hometown, the former captain of the Adelaide Crows has been banned from playing for six games after a racist slur against an Indigenous player from another club. This action could be taken because an Adelaide official reported the comment. And the chair of the Indigenous Players Alliance, Des Headland, said, 
Previously, there's been a lot said in club rooms and change rooms that get swept under the carpet. In terms of the official, that's leadership. It's courageous for people to stand up and call this out. It is a, an individual deciding to take the risk of standing up against racial abuse and the team and the code backing that individual. Something we didn't see enough of when Nikki Winmar was abused by fellow players, media and fans. Something we didn't see enough of when Adam Goods was booed out of football. We all could have and should have done more. It took years for the AFL to reflect on how Mr Goods was treated and offer an apology. So in a speech about closing the gap, why do I bring this up? Because at its core, closing the gap is about leadership. Leadership here and beyond. It's about courage. It's about each of us deciding to do what we can. It's about saying to leaders we will not accept that our first Australians have dramatically fewer opportunities and consistently worse outcomes than other Australians. It is about refusing to tolerate racial abuse or systemic racism. And it is about us those of us who are not First Nations people educating ourselves and not just relying on First Nations people to do the educating. And it's about the leaders of our government looking within themselves and deciding they will no longer contribute to the stubborn gap, that they will actively work to overcome it. The gap between us cannot be sustained if we close the gap within us. Each of us can be leaders in our own families and communities. And we should act as though what we do makes a real difference, because it does. We should seek to find the common humanity in all of us, and we should refuse to abide any threats to that common humanity. And our national government has a particularly responsibi particular responsibility to lead. The national government has a particular responsibility to lead, and that leadership is lacking. For eight long years, this government has shunted its responsibility for progress on closing the gap to states and territories, to future parliaments and future generations. And I wish on this that Mr Morrison would do what he so rarely does and actually take responsibility. There is no leadership without responsibility. It is more than two years since the government said they would change their approach to closing the gap. And it has now reset most of the targets, effectively shifting the goalposts on prior failures. The next closing the gap statement will be a critical test. But for now, I offer these observations. Three targets, family violence, suicide and digital inclusion, do not have any comparison data for the non-Indigenous population. Even if the adult incarceration goal were to be met, the rate would still be more than 11 times higher than for non-Indigenous Australians. And even if the youth incarceration goal were to be met, the rate would be more than 12 times higher than the non-Indigenous population. Only three targets out of 17 are on track. Children born healthy and strong, birth weight, preschool and youth detention. I will say, however, the Labor does welcome the establishment of a Stolen Generations Compensation Scheme. And it was Labor that took reparations for the Stolen Generations to the last election, and we welcome the Morrison government coming on board with this. We will look very closely at its delivery. Former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd commenced the effort to close the gap as part of his apology to the Stolen Generation. Labor now seeks to continue and expand on that tradition. Listening to and empowering First Nations people will be at the very core of Labor's approach to closing the gap and reconciliation, delivering treaty and truth, fulfilling the promise of Uluru. The Uluru Statement called for a national process of treaty and truth-telling overseen by a Makarata Commission, along with a constitutionally enshrined voice to the parliament. And our party is committed to the Uluru Statement in full. We are committed to a constitutionally enshrined voice to parliament and establishing a Makarata Commission as a matter of priority. Because a clear and accurate telling of Australia's story is essential to reaching our full potential as a nation. The disparity in First Nations employment outcomes is connected to other quality of life outcomes such as health, education and housing, which is why we will strengthen economic and job opportunities for First Nations people and communities, including the scrapping of the C community development program and developing a new remote jobs program in partnership with First Nations people and communities. 
a Labor government would get behind inclusive growth for Indigenous businesses, Indigenous owned businesses, both domestically and internationally, and would reaffirm the importance of Indigenous rights and traditional knowledge in future international agreements. Mr President, colleagues, our First Nations peoples were the first traders on this land, the first exporters, and they were the first diplomats engaging with people from other lands. And should I have the honour of serving as Foreign Minister in an Albanese Labor government, this will be recognised at the heart of Australian diplomacy as a matter of Australia's historical and future engagement with other peoples. Australia's diplomacy is a, project a projection of our identity. It is a projection of our values as much as our interests. And our identity can only be complete when Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australia are reconciled. As my friend Senator Dodson says, that is the full expression of our nationhood and the Australia I want to project to the world. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, President. I rise to speak to the Prime Minister's closing the gap address in the other place. But before I do that, I'd like to acknowledge that we are all on stolen land. That's right, it's stolen land. There's been no treaty, it's still stolen, no agreements, it's still stolen. So I'd like to acknowledge all of those uh, survivors of First People right across this country who've maintained resistance and who've survived the mass murders and complete destruction of country who remain here today to share their country culture song dance with us all. I'd like to also acknowledge the black politicians in this colonizers place. We know how hard it is uh, to walk inside that building as First Nations people uh, as well as being a politician. So I acknowledge you all and I acknowledge the difficulty it can be sometimes to walk in two worlds. The recently released Closing the Gap report includes data on the progress made on seven out of the 18 targets set out in the Closing the Gap agreement. It is hard to call it progress when three of these targets, particularly the over imprisonment rates of our people child removals and suicide rates are going up. This report is telling us that the government's strategy isn't working. Our people know that. We've always known that. Mr Morrison isn't just failing in his leadership vacuum. Things are getting worse. Over the last eight years of Liberal government, most key indicators have gone backwards. What's more, the target to reduce First Nations imprisonment by at least 15% by 2031 in the Closing the Gap Plan is completely inadequate. If we were to follow this trajectory, parity on imprisonment will not be achieved until 2093. We'll be dead. None of us here today will see this happen in our lifetime. The Morrison government can't even succeed in working towards this extremely inadequate target. What the Morrison government has done is put the bar on the floor, walked over it and called this progress. That's just how they operate. Smirks and mirrors. The Morrison government is pushing our people backwards every month more and more of our people are dying in police and prison custody. Thousands of our people, our women in particular, are being warehoused in jails on remand. That's right, they haven't even been convicted of a crime but remain in prison. My heart goes out to every black woman in prison right now. This Morrison government is taking our lives away as our people are also at high risk of dying in police custody. There have been almost 500 First Nations deaths in custody since the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody handed down its recommendations 30 years ago. 
to I'm related to. We're not immune, no one's immune. I want to stop and take a moment to honour their lives. Each and every one of them is loved and missed every day. So I'm going to request that the Senate please take a moment silence for all the Aboriginal people who've died in custody. Thank you. It's devastating that our young ones don't get to live to the promise of their full potential because the suicide rates of our young mob is astronomical and it's devastating. Under the Morrison government, more First Nations people are dying by suicide. Our people are more than twice as likely to die by suicide than others. What country do we live in where so many of our people don't see a future for themselves? To all mob, particularly young mob, watching this today, know that you are strong. Know that you are loved. And know that you come from a very, very, very long line of warriors and country defenders. Your ancestors and the stories of your connection to country culture, song, dance, runs through your veins. You are powerful and you are loved. And you are needed. You are needed by your mob, by your culture, by your communities. And you are definitely needed to take seats up in this place. Look at it. Look at this place. There's the ancestors right there. <laughs> They've just smashed a glass behind this screen because they are here with us too. It's shameful that the targets on life expectancy are failing and falling so short of the target. Our people are being killed by a system that tries to choke their potential from the moment they open their eyes. I cannot tell you how many funerals I attend each year. Our community hurts and it deserves better. We are strong and capable despite current injustices. We carry with us over 65,000 years of wisdom and leadership. Our boys, on average, have a life expectancy of 8.6 years, less than non-First Nations boys. And our girls, 7.8 years less. Come on. Come on. Do you have a conscience in there? So many of our boys won't live to the age of 67. That's when many of you fellas in there are starting to enjoy the pleasures of your retirement. Hope you feel good about that. Particularly those of you that are just there for your retirement and not there for the people anymore. We live in one of the richest countries in the world, but our boys in the Northern Territory in Western Australia have in fact a shorter life expectancy than boys in conflict affected areas. How do you explain that to anybody? The report also showed that more First Nations babies are being stolen from their families. What you call out of home care is in fact too often the forceful removal of our children. The stolen generations are not over. They continue to happen right here, day by day. To this day, you take our children away from us to try and diminish our people and our culture. Finally, the Morrison government announced a compensation scheme to survivors of the Stolen Generations. The Stolen Generations compensation scheme announced is a very welcomed and much overdue move, but in practice, 
falls way short of what we need. We Greens have done our research and genuine consultation, not the ticker box, pick a black fella, ticker box gen consultation that both parties use, genuine consultation with members of Stolen Gen and what compensation should look like. We have arrived at $200,000 per survivor as a starting point because no amount of money can compensate for the pain caused by a series of racist, harmful government actions. Does the Prime Minister really believe you can make good with 75,000 measly dollars? on ripping a child from their mother's arms, taken away from their family, community, from country and culture, from language, song and dance. The $75,000 offered to Stolen Gen members in the territories fall way short of what people need and comes way too late. The announcement doesn't include any provisions for the ongoing health needs of survivors, how much of the compensation money will have to be used to afford healthcare and access in particular mental health services. We know First Nations people who have been ripped from their families suffer from increased trans transgenerational trauma. Too many of our people have passed into the dream time already and never seen any attempt of justice. For them, this sadly comes too late. The solutions, I have one more minute, to all of these problems that we did not create have been with us all along. When our people are in the driver's seat, we all prosper. We are hurt by the Morrison government imposing top-down policies and making decisions for us, thinking that they know best. This separates us from our culture and connection to country, things that are central to our health and well-being, making us sicker and die younger. Our people have been managing our own affairs for thousands of years. We must be in charge of our own destiny again. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit, we led the way in keeping our communities safe, but the Northern Territory government sent us body bags before they sent us PPE, assuming we would fail. When decisions are in our hands, our solutions work and we take care of our communities. First Nations culture is about caring for everyone. We modelled this in setting up nations First Nations legal services and community health service back in the late 60s. Imagine a better society where Aboriginal values and leadership are at the heart of decision making. We can only be our best and create a country where everyone can thrive when we listen and acknowledge the truth of our past and present. Together we can work to undo the damage that still causes First Nations people harm today. There is a beautiful tomorrow where we all can thrive and First Nations people make decisions about the future of our country. This government cannot deliver this. This is why they must be voted out. It was legal for Rio Tinto to destroy the Jukun Gorge site. This never would have happened if Blackfellas had a say on their own country. Treaties provide a way to acknowledge past injustices, resolve differences and work out how to create a shared future. As a nation, we have an opportunity to create a 21st century treaty which we can all be a part of and celebrate together. Thank you. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And as leader of the Nationals in the Senate, I'd like to associate the Nationals uh, with a lot of the commentary here this morning, and particularly um, the proposal and comments of Senator Birmingham. I rise to comment briefly on the Closing the Gap Commonwealth Implementation Plan uh, that will make a genuine difference in the outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. And for the National Party, for those uh, over half a million Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who live and work in rural, regional and remote Australia. Because the facts are, despite having the will irrespective of the colour of government, despite having the best of intentions, uh, no matter what level of government, the statistics don't lie and none of us have done well enough over a long period of time to ensure that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders uh, have, can reach, as Senator Thorpe 
uh, made mention of in her contribution, their potential. And so it is up to us, all of us as leaders in this place and in state and territory parliaments, local governments and in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community more broadly, to come together in partnership to make a real, credible difference using evidence. Um, and I think, yes, it has taken a little longer than people might have liked, but the implementation plan uh, that we have before us really sets out clearly targets, goals and programs uh, that, and initiatives that, in partnership with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, will make a difference and close the gap, uh, which is what we all want to see. It is a new chapter of change, and it doesn't happen overnight. This, we won't be reporting uh, groundbreaking changes in stats this time next year. But hopefully, over time, over years, over decades, with a shared commitment and a uh, dedication to stay the course, we will turn that around. It's a completely different way of doing things that we've done before. We've co-designed this in collaboration across governments, peaks and bodies, not just in terms of the economic and social data for health, but with the cultural determinants of health in recognition of the importance of identity. And that is uh, a first. We have piloted these sort of um, three level of government approaches before. I, in, I was privileged to be the minister that signed off on the Barclay Regional Deal uh, a few years ago in 2019, which wanted to improve the productivity and livability of the Barclay through improved economic growth, social outcomes, cultural and placemaking. It was the first regional deal in Australia, a 10 year commitment of over $78 million. And uh, my advice is those 26 projects are proceeding uh, incredibly well, which is fantastic. Last week, the Prime Minister rightfully said that closing the gap is at its core about children, whether it is about child safety, better education outcomes, better health outcomes and maternal, um, maternal outcomes, justice targets, but it is absolutely putting children uh, at the heart and centre of what we're trying to achieve. Quality education and quality teachers have the ability to enrich a child's life and have a profound and meaningful impact on a child's sense of place in the world. And these perceptions and connections are, are formed very, very early. If we want to close the gap, we've got to close it at the beginning, at the very beginning, right from those early years. It doesn't stop there. We need to continue those efforts right throughout a child's schooling uh, and giving them opportunity to participate in tertiary education that they need and deserve. We know that Indigenous kids, particularly those from remote and regional areas, are more likely to start school behind, with the gap only increasing through their schooling life. And If you start behind, it is very, very hard to catch up. It is an additional obstacle during key formative and explorative years. We must do better for these students, and we can. Last week, our government announced now, a quarter of a million dollars to boost quality early childhood and school education for Indigenous kids. But it's not just about the amount of funding. It's about how that investment is focused. And so we're targeting initiatives that improve literacy, because you can't really learn if you can't read, if you don't get those fundamental building blocks right at the start. So using evidence-based approaches that we can scale up uh, through communities and ensure that more Indigenous Australians, uh, children can uh, participate in these programs is at the very, very heart of our initiatives. We know that developing strong literacy skills from an early age uh, supports that right throughout a student's uh, schooling. So we've put $25 million into grants to scale up those evidence-based programs, and they'll be delivered in partnership with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities with a focus on maximising student engagement. We're also delivering a range of measures to support different elements of digital inclusion for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And I will be working with the Minister uh, for in Aboriginal Australians to that end, to make sure that that connectivity is experienced uh, right throughout rural, regional and remote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Future actions will promote community-led responses to build on outcomes that are designed and delivered in partnership. Uh, with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and will be targeted to addressing any gaps in existing measures. 
245 community pay phones and 301 Wi-Fi satellite phones in remote Indigenous communities are managed under the Indigenous Advancement Strategy. Indigenous media activities are also funded under the strategy, primarily through Indigenous broadcasting. Access to fixed broadband voice services is provided to all Australians uh, through the, our USG and USO uh, arrangements, and the $380 million co-investment with states and territories on the Mobile Black Spot funding program will connect, continue to connect communities. I wanted to just mention uh, that we have specifically been funding telecommunications infrastructure across northern Australia. Uh, with $68.5 million in dedicated funding for those projects. We also have a regional telecommunications review, which is currently underway, engaging uh, with rural, regional, remote uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities so that we can make sure our next tranche of policy initiatives uh, meets their needs. As a former teacher, I know the impact that a quality education can have on a young person's life, and the doors that it opens are immense. We also need the basic infrastructure, though, uh, that underpins that, which just isn't physical, it's digital, and it's also about capacity in people, in the teachers that we'll be sending uh, into those classrooms. I'm proud the Nationals will be championing these measures that invest in children and provide the stepping stones required for a prosperous future, an equitable future, where they will be able to walk in two worlds, uh, which we all need to uh, assist that outcome. We must make a difference, and we can only do that with evidence and will, which I believe we have finally got to the table to this very, uh, what has sometimes been a difficult national conversation. We're all in this together. It's essential uh, that we continue to put our shoulder to the wheel to ensure that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, people and their children have a bright, prosperous and sustainable future. Senator McKenzie and I call Senator Hanson remotely. Thank you very much. I rise to speak on the Commonwealth Closing the Gap Implementation Plan. I speak on behalf of many Australians when I say, well, here we go again. More targets, more priorities, more reforms, more agreements, a new approach, and of course, a lot more money. So much treasure has already been expended on with very little to show for it. Targets have not been met, gaps have not been closed, there's been failure on incarceration rates, life expectancy and employment. There's been failure on child mortality rates, children's literacy and numeracy and school attendance. We can only hope the new approach in the national agreement on closing the gap will work. And it might, but only because there is finally some focus on empowering Indigenous Australians to take an equal partnership in the effort to close the gaps. Finally, perhaps sharing equal responsibility for closing the gaps will start chipping away at the insidious culture of victimhood, which has been unjustly imposed on Indigenous Australians. I speak for many Australians when I say we look forward to a future where there are no gaps. We look forward to a future when all Australians, regardless of race, are able to avail themselves of the great opportunities that come with living, learning and working in this great nation. Many Indigenous Australians have already broken this ground and discovered new fertile, how fertile it is. Many have made their marks on our country's culture, history, identity and character. As I have said before, the majority of Indigenous Australians are not victims. They are capable, resilient and valuable citizens of this great nation and we are a better country thanks to their contributions. Dare I even say that we look forward to a future when reconciliation is completed, when we can full finally agree that we are in fact reconciled. Many Australians, Indigenous or not, would be forgiven for being sceptical about those prospects. <clears throat> because the gaps will not be closed and reconciliation will never be completed as long as we continue to indulge the disgusting politics of racial division. This allows the unaccountable Aboriginal industry to prey on Indigenous communities and feast on Australian taxpayers by perpetrating difference, entrenching disadvantage and fostering a culture victimhood. 
For these businesses and bureaucrats, it's a license to print money. That's why they're cheering on the politics of racial division, supremely confident this government and this parliament would always indulge it. And there is nothing more racially divisive than the push to specifically recognise Indigenous people in the Australian Constitution and to legislate an Indigenous voice to Parliament with the aim to eventually put that in the Constitution too. One Nation will take every opportunity to speak on behalf of the many Australians who will never support Indigenous exceptionalism being enshrined in the Constitution and will strongly oppose this attempt, this attempt to divide us by race forever. It took 66 years for our Constitution to be finally made colour blind, removing all specific references to Indigenous people. It may take less time to reverse this important achievement by once again signalling out Indigenous people to be treated differently from their fellow Australians. I have warned the Senate and the Australian people about the potential ramifications of recognising traditional ownership in the Constitution should we ever become a republic. Traditional ownership could effectively take the place of the Crown and the vast majority of Australians would no longer have sovereignty over their own country or land. I have reminded the Senate that one of the essential foundations of a representative democracy is that every citizen is equal before the law and every citizen has equal political franchise. <clears throat> one adult, one vote. A voice to Parliament would effectively give a minority of Australians more political power than the majority of Australians based on race. In South Africa, <coughs> that sort of thing was called apartheid. Fortunately, Apartheid is something that has been banished to the past. Let's not revisit it in Australia. Recognise Indigenous people in the Constitution and creating a voice to Parliament will only open new gaps while doing nothing to meet the targets of the government's new implementation plan. As I noted earlier, we hope the new approach will work and the important targets will be met as soon as possible. We have hope in particular for commitments to incentivise or expand service delivery in child and family safety and in education based on evidence that they work. Too much money has been wasted on approaches which didn't work even after it was evident. We have hope for the improved health outcomes coming from a large investment in health infrastructure and equipment in remote areas. We have hope for positive outcomes with more resources going into alcohol and drug treatments. We have hope because there are practical measures that can make a positive difference to the lives of Indigenous Australians where there is a clear need to do so. As I have said before, that's where the focus of this government and this parliament should be, on what Australians need to make a positive difference. We don't need to change the constitution to make that positive difference. It would risk the progress which has been made towards reconciliation it would risk the sovereignty every Australian rightfully has over this country. It would further divide the people of Australia at a time when there are already too many entrenched divisions over almost every other important issue. Let us not move backward. Let us not revisit a racist past. Let us leave the Constitution forever blind to race and colour. Let us no longer condescend to Indigenous Australians by tolerating the culture of victimhood which only entrenches disadvantage for generations. Let us show Indigenous Australians the respect they have earned and long deserved by treating them as equals, as individuals and not as victims looking for a handout. Let us abandon the awful politics of racial division and work with Indigenous Australians to close the gap so that all of us can fully share in our nation's boundless opportunities and respect, take responsibility for the course of our lives we'll take. I'm going to take a, a minute or two to actually um, give my uh, opinion on the diatribe that came out of Senator Thorpe's mouth. I, as an Australian, was born here, and, and I myself am Indigenous to this land. I'm native to this land. I was born here, as many Australians feel. To continually be thrown up 
that I don't belong here or the fact is that it's stolen land. Um, I think it's a slap in the face to have her comments in the floor of parliament to call white privileged Australians, as she said to a couple of senators, white old privileged males. This is not pulling us together. This is not working together for reconciliation. She does not acknowledge the Australians that were born here. To say that there is a rate of over imprisonment, it's like any Australian, if you break the law, you have to pay a penalty for it. And that means that imprisonment, then people must take responsibility for their own actions. When she speaks of children being ripped from the arms of parents, that's because children in these communities at such a young baby age, toddlers are being raped by their family members. We don't speak up about that. Yes, they will be taken away from their families as it is in the white society. You cannot blame it on your cultural differences. These are children that need to be protected. And if families are not protecting their children, as far as education, I have visited these remote communities. People can send their children to school at the expense of the taxpayers. They're given every opportunity for an education. They're given every opportunity with the privileges paid for by the taxpayers. That other children don't have that opportunity. Billions, hundreds of billions of dollars have been thrown at this Aboriginal industry, and yet we still talk about it today. Nothing's changed. You have representation in that parliament. People claim to have Aboriginal backgrounds. Fair enough. But I am also here to represent on the floor of parliament those Indigenous Australians as every other senator and other, every other member of parliament. Do not continue to divide us by throwing more money out of it without accountability. Do audits on this system. Ask why the Land Council won't hand over their land to the Aboriginal people for their independence so they can move forward with their lives. We don't do that. Why is it shut down? There has to be questions asked. Don't be afraid to ask them and speak up on behalf of those Australians. Senator Hanson, thank you. Um, I now call Senator Dodson remotely. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy Speaker. Uh, firstly, I want to pay tribute to my people, the Yaru people, and to their resilience. Uh, they are the traditional owners and native title holders of the land from where I speak uh, to you today my electoral office in Western Australia, the town of Broome. I also acknowledge and pay my respects to the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional owners of the lands in Canberra. I wish I could uh, report that I was uplifted last week to hear the Prime Minister talk about the Commonwealth's Closing the Gap implementation plan. Sadly, I was not so moved. Not only because the previous week, the Productivity Commission had released the annual tables of data, which again confirmed that the lives of First Nations peoples continue to be blighted by poor health and disadvantage. No, it wasn't just the report card that depressed me. It was a telling sentence in the accompanying media release from the Prime Minister and his Minister for Indigenous Australians that cast a pall. They said their plan to close the gap was about real reconciliation. That one sentence told me that the thinking of this government in relation to First Nations peoples is as stagnant as it was 25 years ago when John Howard was Prime Minister. The Prime Minister who gutted the Native Title Act, the Prime Minister who rejected the social justice package that was meant to accompany the Native Title Act, the Prime Minister who refused to say sorry to the stolen generations, the Prime Minister who destroyed ATSIC. It was Prime Minister John Howard who used to run the line we heard again last week from Prime Minister Morrison that service delivery will deliver real reconciliation. But before I grapple with the question of how um, the government's agenda to close the gap will do little to achieve real reconciliation, let me remind you 
just how wide the gap remains after eight years of a coalition government. The Productivity Committee's, Commission's latest data are woeful. Whereas non-Indigenous females, on average, can expect to live to 83.4 years, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island women have a life expectancy of 75.6 years, a gap of 7.8 years. Indigenous men die younger than Indigenous women, but their gap against non-Indigenous men is worse, 8.6 years. The data is just as dismal in early life. The proportion of Aboriginal children assessed as developmentally on track is only 35.2% as against 56% of non-Indigenous kids. And the proportion of those who attain year 12 is 63.2% for Indigenous youth as against 85.5% for non-Indigenous. The figures for tertiary qualifications and employment are just as bleak. But the statistic uh, that has uh, always startled me has to do with incarceration and what euphemistically is called out-of-home care. And they show no signs of improvement. Out of every 100,000 Indigenous adults, more than 2,000 are in custody. For the rest of the population, the figure is 156. And whereas 56 out of every 1,000 Indigenous children are in out-of-home care, only five out of every 1,000 non-Indigenous kids have been removed from their families. This government is now hoping that its partnership with the states and territories and the Coalition of Peaks, Indigenous organisations and communities, will lead to better outcomes. <coughs> I want to congratulate Patricia Turner, the lead convener of the Coalition of Peaks, for her sterling role in getting the government to practise its mantra of doing things with First Nations peoples and not to them. This is how a true democracy would deliver for its citizens if it truly respected and accepted them as such. But let's not be fooled by this government's other mantra that its latest agenda to go to closing the gap represents real reconciliation. While First Nations peoples remain unrecognised in the Constitution, the expectation that the Federation will respond positively to their citizenship needs is at odds with our past experience. And for the fanfare last week about implementation plans, governments have still to agree on new targets to do with Indigenous interests in inland waters and with community infrastructure. The first target prescribes a 15% increase in Aboriginal land mass subject to Indigenous rights and interests and a 15% increase in their rights or interest in the sea. The second target would aim for parity in infrastructure, essential services and environmental health. The Joint Council on Closing the Gap met last Friday but couldn't reach consensus on either target. The meeting agreed to defer further consideration to November when I, when I hope that goodwill will prevail. <coughs> but this demonstrates the perennial challenge of negotiating at a table which rests on the unresolved legacy of terra nullius and the denied sovereignty of First Nations peoples. First Nations peoples don't want to be mere recipients of largesse from the public purse. We call all, we can all quibble and about the targets and 
tut tut about the perennial failure to achieve them, but sovereignty, recognition, and treaty, the real substance of reconciliation, is the bedrock on which to build a better quality of life for all in this nation. The Uluru statement from the heart said, the ancient sovereignty of the First Nations people can shine through as a fuller expression of Australians' nationhood. It spoke of the torment of our powerlessness. The national agreement goes some way towards acknowledging this truth. As we approach the fifth anniversary of the National Constitutional Convention at Uluru, the plaintive pleas of the powerful statement that emerged from there remains unanswered, as in fact and as in the spirit in which it was given. The Prime Minister's report last week that the government had received the final report from Professor Langton and Tom Kelmer about a co-designed voice. A voice to be enshrined in the Constitution was, of course, a fundamental demand of the Uluru Statement. If this government wants a voice, it must release the report from the co-design process so that the public has an opportunity to view the, and explore the proposal and, secondly, begin the process for the referendum to embed the voice in the Constitution. But if it refuses, but it refuses to give us a timetable, uh, on either of these matters. Some might want this process to be faster, the Prime Minister told the Senate Parliament last week. Well, he might be right. The government has to come clear to the Australian public. Will it or will it not support a constitutionally enshrined voice to the Parliament? Stringing the Parliament along and the public along, as the government continues to do, is nothing short of cowardice. And it's a disgrace that has not even embraced the other fundamental statements of the Uluru Statement. The call for a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making and truth telling. On this side, the Labor, Labor Party remains unwavering in its commitment to implementing the Uluru Statement in full. Let me be very clear. We support a referendum to enshrine a voice to Parliament in the Constitution. Our leader has committed to this in the first term of a Labor government. And we will also commit to establishing a Makarata Commission to progress the other two critical elements, truth and treaty. I appeal to the government to join with Labor and let's do something worthwhile for once on behalf of the First Nations peoples. Then we can really start closing the gap towards real reconciliation. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Senator Dodson. And I call Senator McCarthy remotely. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'd like to acknowledge the Larrakia people on whose land uh, I stand for this uh, address of closing the gap. <laughs> and just pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, but also to uh, all Australians who are witnessing uh, what we are discussing in the Senate and seeing the many diverse views and thoughts uh, in regards to how we certainly want to improve the lives of First Nations people. Uh, the Parliament hasn't got it right. Australians haven't got it right. But what's important is that we respectfully listen to the diverse views that come forward, which are really a reflection of what we see across Australia. And some of those views that have been expressed uh, are incredibly hurtful as well. And I think that um, it's important, first off, Madam Acting Deputy President, if I can just pick up on some of the commentary by Senator Hanson. I think it's really important, Senator Hanson, and this message is directly to you, the First Nations um, people Senator do McCarthy. not. Senator McCarthy, I, I, I wait with interest what you're about to say, but I do ask you to make your remarks to the chair. Through the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, this is certainly in response to previous speakers, uh, in particular Senator Hanson, 
uh, that the First Nations people of this country certainly do not see ourselves as victims. And it's certainly not a uh, position that we want to be in when women are in uh, incredible uh, pain of domestic and family violence. And that's all women who experience it. They certainly don't want to be victims. And I think we have to be really careful with the language that we use in the Senate, in the Australian Parliament, uh, in terms of trying to lift people from circumstances that usually are beyond their control. And it's the kind of leadership that this Senate needs to portray uh, in the language that we use. And I did want to pick you up on that, uh, Senator Hanson, because uh, we're certainly not victims in terms of wanting to stay victims. Uh, but we certainly experience uh, unfair and unnecessary statistics that this is what closing the gap is all about. And that's why it is important the Australian Parliament addresses it and acknowledges the imperfections of our ability to get it right. But the fact that we still are able to uh, address it as a country every year on a particular day, which is now in August, uh, it says and sends a message to all Australians that it matters that we try to improve the lives and the disadvantage of First Nations people in this country. And we should never, ever be ashamed and unafraid to, uh, to try and continue to address it, no matter how difficult and complex the circumstances are. That is really a reflection of the thousands of languages that our people have across this country, but also the hundreds and hundreds of different First Nations groups across Australia. And that is the most beautiful thing about speaking and closing the gap. That I, as a Yanyua Gaidal woman, surrounded by my clans of the Mata and Gurangi peoples, linked closely with the uh, Nuka mob, with Nungurwa mob, with Brood Island mob, and the song lines and the Bujiga that travels. That's what we can share with the rest of Australia, is the stories that none of you are aware of, unless you enable us to speak to have a voice to speak to you, but not only for us to speak to you, for your hearts to be open to listen, your ears to be empty of the sand that seems to consistently block you from hearing our stories. The Prime Minister has followed Labor's lead by committing to reparations for the injustices done to those removed as children from their families in former Commonwealth Territories, the Northern Territory and Jarvis Bay and the ACT. And I do thank the Prime Minister for hearing the voices of those stolen generations mob. It's taken a hell of a long time. But if you're sincere in making sure that these mob here in the Northern Territory in particular are dealt with respectfully and immediately in terms of that, then it will go a long way to bringing about a great deal of healing for those families. I acknowledge the more than 600 people who attended the Going Home Conference here in Darwin in 1994. This event brought together hundreds of First Nations people removed as children to discuss common goals of access to archives, compensation, rights to land and social justice. And I acknowledge all those who told their stories in the Bringing Them Home report, the findings of the National Inquiry into the separation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families, I acknowledge the work of people like Mrs Cabillo the late, and Mr Gunner who braved the complexities of our legal system to take on the Commonwealth over its historical policies of forced child removal. While their legal claim was unsuccessful, and I remember that day, the need for justice and reparations for survivors of the stolen generations was recognised by the Australian community and governments. And after the legal decision was handed down in this case in 2000, the Senate Legal and Constitutional References Committee delivered its report into the Stolen Generations, recommending the establishment of a reparations tribunal to address the need for an effective reparation, including the provision of individual monetary compensation. Yet it wasn't until 2006 that the first Stolen Generations compensation scheme in Australia was set up in Tasmania by the Stolen Gens of Aboriginal Children Act. Then in 2008, the first Stolen Gens compensation case was successful in the Supreme Court of South Australia. The Trevorrow judgment recognised 
the existence of the policy of removing Aboriginal children from their families and the detrimental long-term effects of that policy on both removed children and on the wider community. We are still experiencing an even greater removal of First Nations children. These legacies and these past policies do have a profound impact and they do matter. Of course, in 2008, we had the national apology and parliament was open for the first time with an acknowledgement of country. The stolen generation survivors in the Northern Territory had still not received reparations or justice. In April this year, stolen generation survivors from the Northern Territory launched a class action against the Commonwealth. Eileen Cummings is one of the lead plaintiffs in the class action, a daughter of a Nullican woman and Rambanda man who was born in Central Arnhem Land and her story echoes so many. She was taken from her family at five years old, taken to Darwin and Croker Island, where she was forbidden to leave, prevented from speaking her language or practice culture. I don't know how you can arrive at a dollar figure on the trauma and harm caused by tearing children away from their families, not just on the children, but on the families and the wider community. But I certainly hope the redress announced last week goes some way to acknowledging the harm caused by these policies. We should also reflect on the harsh reality that First Nations people are far more likely to have their children removed from their care than non-Indigenous Australians. We still have an incredibly long way to go. It appears the Prime Minister has heard some of the voices calling for change and recognition, but it still does not acknowledge broader issues. The high incarceration rates of First Nations people, the Black Lives Matter rallies across the country, the sadness and the trauma that still exists for those who lose family and members way too early. Only last week, I lost a family member, someone who's a strong elder in our community, and our family's still grieving. He should never have passed away so young, but an important elder who did so much for our people. I remember him. I remember my other Ngabiji, my other Gorgul, my grandfathers, my uncles, my grandmothers, my goodies, who passed away in recent months, who should be here with us. Renal disease, kidney disease. Every member just about in my family is in some chronic disease. That is what this Closing the Gap statement is all about. Trying to help and give hope to First Nations people who so desperately want to be not only seen as equals in Australia, but respected for the beautiful and diverse and strong culture that we have as First Nations people. To be respected and to take our place with dignity, to be the people that we're here to be without racism, without being locked up, without being kept in hospital, to play on the sporting fields like Paddy Mills, Ash Barty. That's the Australia we want for First Nations people. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. And I call Senator Bragg remotely. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, I'd like to associate myself with almost all the remarks that have been made this morning, and I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners. Uh, now, I really wanted to address three things, and the first is this national uh, agreement. I also wanted to talk about um, some of the financial commitments that have been made and also uh, the way forward on The Voice. Uh, I guess the first thing I'd say is uh, I think that the, the fashioning of this national agreement on the closing the gap, which has been done in conjunction uh, with the state and territory governments and the coalition of the peaks, I, I think really is a genuine attempt to try and move from this idea that we would uh, do to, to do with. Uh, and I think that for people who followed this, uh, these issues closely, uh, the success the Indigenous community has had in managing COVID-19, I think provides a very good example of uh, why it's important to put Indigenous people in control of their own affairs. 
And I think it is quite a simple concept. And so, um, so much of the effort of the new national agreement and partnership is going into uh, community capacity building uh, and is going into uh, Indigenous uh, decision making and, con and control. And I think that is a, a very important and urgent, urgent reform. Um, I mean, people are aware that there are priorities that have been identified out of the 17 closing the gap uh, targets. And as I say, uh, I think a good deal of the additional financial contributions are going into building up capacity of uh, Aboriginal medical services, uh, health services, childcare services and the like. Um, it is important that the data is clear and that we can all be held to account here. And I do think that getting the Productivity Commission involved and helping us uh, track and better understand uh, the progress that is made in these areas is critical for people who have looked at the recent report done by uh, the Indigenous Productivity Commissioner, Mr Mocock. Uh, people would know that I think the Productivity Commission's view is that this is not a question of how much money that is spent in this area. It is a question of um, getting the investment right so that it does drive the outcomes that the community is seeking. Um, I wanted to turn to this, uh, the billion dollar commitment that has been made as part of the Closing the Gap um, agenda. And I think supporting uh, the justice targets, supporting the language targets are very important. Uh, there is $378 million to support the stolen generations where people had been stolen from Commonwealth Territories, the Australian Capital Territory, the Northern Territory. Uh, and this is, this is an important commitment. And I know that it has bipartisan support. Um, no one is saying that $75,000 can replace your life. Uh, I think it is an important gesture. Uh, there needs to be, and I think there is additional support that will be put around that. Uh, and I urge the addition, the other states of Australia to put in place a, a system which is at least as good as this. And I do, I do welcome the leadership from the Commonwealth, um, which has been done in a bipartisan way. Uh, and the Commonwealth has led in the past. I mean, the Commonwealth was the first jurisdiction to put in place a land rights regime um, in the Northern Territory, which was decades ahead of some other Australian states. So I think it's important that where there are other states that have not put in place redress schemes for the stolen generations, that they, they, they do that quickly. They do that quickly uh, because uh, it is only fair. Now, um, in relation to, to language, and there is $22 million that's been put in, put in place to support Indigenous language, uh, it recognises that Indigenous languages um, are endangered and are, in fact, some of the most endangered languages in the world. I think supporting the idea of children's books is important. I've had my own experience uh, with this in uh, engaging deeply with the work of AATSIS, uh, which is an organisation that was set up by the Menzies government to conserve and preserve Indigenous culture and language. And what AATSIS has been doing has been to work with local communities to ensure that languages are preserved and then able to be to be used. Uh, one such concept that I'm quite aware of is, is the Daruga Dictionary, which has been published by the Yuan people of the south coast of New South Wales, where um, some of the community uh, elders have developed a dictionary, which is now being used around towns like uh, Maruya, uh, which I think is incredibly uh, transformational uh, when you think that uh, the kids that go to those schools will, will learn um, basic Daruga uh, as well as they learn learning um, English. And so the, the traditional owners uh, were, were kind enough to allow me to use their, their language for some uh, work I've been doing uh, lately. The, the other thing that uh, is being put on the language agenda is the, the dual naming of places, which I know in the past has caused some consternation, but 
I think if people are serious about reconciliation, um, I think it's a very fair and very reasonable idea that you could have dual names for, for places. Uh, and I think, in fact, that would only um, enrich us all. Finally, I wanted to turn to, to this issue of the voice. Um, I mean, effectively, the idea of having an Indigenous voice, which was put forward formally uh, by the Uluru Statement that uh, had previously been put on the agenda by the Cape York Institute, um, is simply the idea that you would consult Indigenous people over laws and policies that are made about them. And I think that is an entirely reasonable um, and quite a conservative um, idea. Um, I don't think that was handled well uh, at the time in 2017 when the Uluru Statement was handed down. But I do think that there has been some important progress after that. Uh, Senator Dodson and uh, uh, Mr Lisa uh, co-chaired a report which was a bit of a framework for how a voice could be developed. And we have followed that, or the government has followed that report. Uh, and in recent times, uh, Marsha Langton and Tom Calmer have been asked to develop a report in conjunction with Indigenous communities about what, in fact, a voice would be. Now, a voice at the local level could be about uh, giving advice on service delivery, again, um, working in conjunction to drive uh, capacity building and control. The second thing it would do is it would be a national voice which would provide advice on laws and policies. I mean, I'm, I've often thought when I sat in the Senate, we've dealt with things like native title amendments. I mean, wouldn't it be good if we knew what the people um, who these laws are made for thought about these proposals? And I think we could do so much better in this space if we had a national voice to advise the parliament and the government about national Indigenous issues. I think to, I'd say to the people that are concerned about this, I mean, why on earth would we be afraid of getting more advice from the citizens? The citizens? Mm -hmm. I just think it is such, such a good idea. And so now with that co-design report that is sitting uh, with the executive government, with the minister, um, I think that, that is the meat on the bones on the, on the voice. Uh, and I hope that that report uh, can be the basis of us putting in place a voice uh, in conjunction with a referendum to be held in the next term um, that would be held after there was a process to consider constitutional amendments. Uh, and I think we are getting towards the point where we do need a process where Indigenous people, non-Indigenous people can put forward their views on what they think would be the most appropriate way to put uh, the voice in the constitution. And I think that there are a range of different models uh, that people um, should be able to look at and consider and take into account the concerns of constitutional conservatives and the like. Uh, my view is that you can definitely put in place an obligation on the Commonwealth to consult with Indigenous people on laws and policies that are made about them, uh, which is effectively a voice and uh, then you could legislate the voice, thereby maintaining parliamentary supremacy. So um, I know these are important issues. Um, I agree with the Prime Minister that we shouldn't be trying to rush this reform. It's too important and it's very important that we work with uh, the Labor Party to maintain bipartisanship. And I'd like to acknowledge the Labor Party's efforts in this area, I think, uh, have been uh, very good. And uh, this is a, an important reform that shouldn't be rushed. I'm glad it won't be. And I'd like to thank the Senate for its time this morning. Thank you, Senator Bragg. I call Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise today to make a contribution to the debate on the government's Closing the Gap implementation plan. I acknowledge that we are meeting here today on stolen Ngunnawal country and that sovereignty over this land was never ceded and is, continues to need to be addressed. The latest plan to close the gap simply can't accomplish its targets until we address issues around past injustice, colonialisation of this land, sovereignty and treaty. The continued legacy of colonialisation in this country and its ongoing impacts have to be addressed if we are going to truly close the gap, because that is what's causing this huge gap or has led to this huge gap uh, to be developed in the first place. First Nations peoples continue to experience ongoing dispossession and oppression. 
deaths in custody serve to remind us that this, pain, this period of violence and injustice has in fact not yet finished. Until these first injustices and the massive injustice of the fact that we stole this land is resolved, none of the other injustices can be properly addressed. And we cannot claim that we have closed. We cannot claim and we won't close the gap. Resolving this means negotiating and enacting treaties and treaties in this land. We need to address the issue of sovereignty. We must ensure that sovereignty is recognised through a treaty and treaties first approach. First Nations peoples have been traumatised by the generational actions and policies of successive governments denying them their rights. We must not forget that. Every year when we talk about closing the gap, I also make sure that I raise the issue of the Close the Gap, Committee, uh, Close the Gap Campaign's uh, report. It used to be called the Shadow Report. They have again um, done another report. This is the 12th annual report. Um, this year it's titled Leadership and Legacy Through Crises, Keeping Our Mobs Safe. This year's report was produced by the Lowitcher Institute, Australia's community-controlled National Institute for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Research. They make 15 recommendations with a lot of uh, sub-recommendations. But they remind us that in their annual reports, they often repeat their recommendations. That comes as no surprise, I'm afraid to say. And we remain steadfast and persistent in the expectation that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander ways of knowing, being and doing will be respected and understood. The time for governments to deliver has long since passed. They also say that self-determination is critical and to ensure that change occurs, our voices must be heard by governments at every level of society. We perpetually recommend the same approach to involve us, to listen, to reform and invest, be in it systemic reform, policy design, service delivery, evaluation or agreeing upon funding. Nothing about us without us will be the only successful approach. And that remains true to the, in this report as well, because we are still not delivering on some of the key areas that need to be addressed. There are countless examples of government policies that continue to deny First Nations peoples of their rights and undermine closing the gap. The government continues to turn away from raising the age of criminal responsibility across the federal government and state and territory governments. I'm absolutely shamed and embarrassed by the fact that they still drag their feet. The new Closing the Gap plan includes targets to reduce the rate of First Nations peoples in prisons by at least 15 per cent. At least 15 per cent. This is just unconscionable that you could limit yourselves to this. How are we still locking up children? How can we meaningfully achieve this target when the government or any targets of getting children out of prisons while the government has this measly target but also while we are locking up children of 10 years of age? It is unconscionable, and I totally support the comments and acknowledge the a massive contribution that Senator Thorpe made in this chamber this morning, where she clearly highlighted this issue. Incarcerating children doesn't help them, it brutalises them. Children do not belong in jail. We need more investment in prevention through justice and social reinvestment. We also need ongoing secure funding for Aboriginal legal organisations. It is shameful that the Commonwealth and the Northern Territory governments have shown disregard to the Royal Commission and to the protection and detention of children in the Northern Territory, and most of their recommendations, in fact, remain unimplemented. It is no surprise that the Dondale Royal Commission recommenda recommendations have been so thoroughly ignored, unfortunately. Thirty years since the Deaths in Custody Royal Commission, more First Nations peoples are dying in custody than when the Commission was called. The language used in the new Closing the Gap plan is clear. This is a plan, this plan, this is a plan that was developed by ministers and departments and governments with First Nations peoples. It wasn't developed by 
um, First Nations peoples. First Nations peoples need to be in the driving seat. We cannot close the gap until First Nations peoples have control over policies and genuine community-led decision-making. I do congratulate the people and the organisations that have been driving this agenda, have been taking it up to government continually to address this issue of closing the gap. My comments are not meant to cast a slide on them at all. They have been driving this agenda, and if it wasn't their commitment, we wouldn't be where we are now. But we still have a long way to go. The government says they are listening to First Nations peoples, but when it comes to social policy that impacts First Nations peoples, what they're actually doing is listening to the billionaires. The cashless debit card, dreamed up by a millionaire, harks back to the old ration days. There is no consent for this card in First Nations communities. It is making people's lives harder. Their fundamental rights to choice and control and making their own decisions has been taken away from them. And what did I just comment on earlier? We need to ensure that First Nations peoples are, in a, are supported and ensure that they are the ones making the decisions. The government knows the, the cashless debit card doesn't work because value after, evaluation after evaluation has shown that. But they continue to pour millions into it. How about putting the millions into addressing treaty, to, ingest, to addressing injustices and the criminal justice system to make sure that it's not locking up 10-year-olds? First Nations women are also disproportionately impacted by punitive programs, such as the Punitive Parents Next program. Parents Next is not culturally safe for First Nations parents and results in a disproportionate number of First Nations parents losing their payments. Programs like these directly contradict the closing, of a gap, the, closing the gap objectives. We need supportive approaches that are led and delivered by First Nations peoples. The cashless debit card and Parents Next program entrench and exacerbate poverty in First Nations communities. It is plain hypocrisy to claim that the government is committed to closing the gap, to make promises about community decision making, to make promises about working with First Nations peoples when they are not listening to First Nations peoples when they say that these programs are punitive, that they don't work. The evidence shows that they don't work. But this government continues to pursue these programs. So on one hand, they're here with their implementation plan saying they're committed to closing the gap, while their very programs and actions undermine those commitments. And it's in such clear it's so clearly contrary to what First Nations peoples are saying to them. At the same time they claim they are listening to First Nations peoples. They are delivering programs that undermine the very implementation plan that we are talking about today. There needs to be significant change in this country. We need to start it by acknowledging that we stole this land, that sovereignty was never treated, uh, ceded, that we need to have treaty and treaties in this country, and then we need to make sure, as part of that process, that we are ensuring that truth is told and then we need to make sure that we have policies and programs in place that are led and delivered by First Nations peoples if we are going to close the gap. Thank you, Senator Seward. Senator Lyons. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I acknowledge that we are meeting on the lands of the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present and emerging leaders, and I acknowledge that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land and that sovereignty has never been ceded. I want to also associate myself with the comments, uh, the statements made by Senators Wong. McCarthy and Dodson. And I also want to say to Senator Seawitt, your adv advocacy on behalf of First Nations peoples will be missed in this chamber when you leave. I want to start by really challenging the government's response to closing the gap, because it's built on a system which I think uh, both Senator Dodson and McCarthy have outlined. It's built on a failed system 
It's, that system has failed, and so we're not really going back to the fundamentals to look at how we need to change things. And despite the words of the Prime Minister in saying that we want to do things with Aboriginal people, when you continue to build on a system which has failed, you will never be working hand in hand with First Nations people. And in order for us to re-establish the system, we have to come to grips with the truth. We do need truth-telling. That is the fundamental start to acknowledge the past wrongs that people, white people, colonisers did to our First Nations people. That's the starting point, and we've never acknowledged that. We've said sorry to the stolen generations, but even that, as proud as I was to be in this parliament and to hear that address, is not enough. We've got to go back, right back, to truth-telling from the day we set foot as non-First Nations peoples into this country and move on from there, because that's where true partnerships will emerge from. That is the starting point. When I look at Western Australia and I see all of the um, massacre sites, which really only a handful of people know about, is disgraceful. They should be. They are part of our history. And they're not that old in Western Australia, sadly. And those generations involved in the massacres and the, and the people who perpetrated those massacres are only a few generations away. It's still living memory. One of the other issues I want to challenge is the notion that I heard from the Prime Minister last year and this year, and it really got up my nose, and sadly it was repeated by Senator Birmingham in this place, is that the government wants uh, First Nations children to be proud. Well, they are proud. It really bugs me to hear that. My granddaughter, Gidja from Warnham, from stolen generations, is a proud young Aboriginal woman. And how dare the Prime Minister of this country somehow thinks he needs to fix her belief in herself? She's got a strong belief in herself. I'm incredibly proud of her. As well as a couple of months ago, along with uh, Senator McAllister and Senator Seaworth, we had the privilege, the absolute privilege, of being invited to a meeting in Broome held by Kimberley women. And it took June Oscar's report, which the government has made no comment on, a report, a landmark report, not research and interviews that haven't been done in 30 or 40 years, where June Oscar, in her role as commissioner, went across the country listening to what young Aboriginal girls and women were telling her. And she produced this report, which is their voices across this country. And the Morrison government doesn't even have uh, the respect to even respond to that report. But the Kimberley women did. We had 100, about 100 women in the room from all over the Kimberley, and they were so powerful. And they took June Oscar's report and they looked at how it might work across the Kimberley. And everyone participated, young women, older women, women from all over the Kimberley. And on day three, they'd invited the uh, state Aboriginal minister to come up, uh, Stephen Dawson, and they told him very clearly they didn't want a seat at his table. Not interested in that. They wanted him to come to their table. And that's what true listening is about. It's about acknowledging um, First Nations people where they are and how they want that partnership to develop. And they were very powerful and they told the state in no uncertain terms what the expectation was. And again, the pride, the respect in that room for each other was palpable. You could feel it in the air. And they had some um, women come from, I think, Senator McCarthy's country and do this um, brought this amazing dance and spirit with them, and it just lifted the room. It was very, very powerful. And it's just appalling 
that the Morrison government completely misses that complexity, that respect that's there. And we've just had two um, Aboriginal women elected to the state parliament uh, in WA, both from the Kimberley. Um, and uh, the respect for those women, the love, the support and the pride for those women to be successful was huge. So don't, Mr Morrison, speak to First Nations people about respect and about who they should be, because they already are. We're just not watching, we're not listening and we're not working in, in the right ways. And as long as we have punitive measures that harm Aboriginal people, such as the cashless debit card, such as the CDP, such as Parents First. We are not in a partnership. That is not about partnership. They are punitive measures. And I attended and I have attended most of the um, Senate inquiries we've had on the cashless debit card. And when we were in Kalgoorlie, who did we hear from? The local councils. Now, since when do local councils in Western Australia deliver social services? They don't, but it didn't stop them from having an opinion. It did not stop them from having an opinion. And again, what I heard in those cashless debit card hearings was all about this deficit agenda. And sadly, that's what I've heard from the Prime Minister in his Closing the Gap address, repeated in here. Uh, by Senator Birmingham is this deficit model. Instead of stepping back and saying, we have responsibility here, we have created some of this harm, we have created these appalling statistics. In WA, it is shameful that we are still locking up children as young as 10 who actually don't commit custodial uh, they don't commit crimes that get them a custodial sentence, but because we have not a good bail system, they end up in custody for stealing a piece of fruit, for stealing a couple of chocolate bars in a shop. Well, I can say right here and now, as a young white kid, I stole chocolate bars from shops. Did I end up in juvenile detention? No, I didn't, because the colour of my skin is white. And yet today, right across Australia, and it's only the ACT so far who's moved on this, we are still locking up 10-year-olds. Now, if that doesn't do harm, I don't know what does. They're babies. They've barely got their double teeth. They're just kids, beautiful kids, and we are locking them up. So I don't quite know how we've met the um, youth detention um, statistic in closing the gap. I, I, I bet it's because we are only looking at children who receive a custodial sentence, not all the ones that we've held in custody awaiting their opportunity to go before a magistrate at the children's court. Um, the CDP. We have seen some insulting programs across this country. We've seen people being breached. And all of those uh, measures, all they're doing is casting First Nations people further into poverty because they all involve the withholding of money. And that is not about working in partnership. That's not about respecting the place that First Nations people are in. That is not about creating partnerships for the future. That's about continuing being the colonising government who does punitive harm to First Nations people. And so when you grow out of that system to survive shows what an amazing person you are. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lyons. Uh, Senator Faruqi, remotely. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I speak to the Prime Minister's Closing the Gap address and associate myself with the heartfelt comments made by my colleagues, Senator Thor and Senator Seward. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the many lands that we are here from today and pay my respects to elders past and present. I'm on the land of the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, but no matter where we are in this country, we are on stolen land. And I do this acknowledgement in full recognition of the fact that we are still so far away from justice for First Nations people. So as we strive for justice and equality, First Nations people and their voices must be front and center of the struggle. 
because there can be no social or environmental justice without racial justice, and there can be no racial justice without First Nations justice. Australia has a colonial past and a bloody history that is tainted with dispossession and violence. This violence against First Nations people has never ceased. It continues to this day in the settler colonial systems and structures of this country. The depth and breadth of prejudice against First Nations people is still rooted in law enforcement and societal attitudes and in institutional systems. It is also sadly rooted in this parliament and this chamber. Listening to this morning's debate, I hear a lot of sadness and reflection, but I also hear some ignorance and malice. There are still members of this place who refuse to acknowledge the systemic racism, who refuse to acknowledge the suffering and our collective need to address it. The 2021 Closing the Gap report shows almost all key indicators have gone backwards since the Liberals came into power. Rates of suicide have worsened and there are rising numbers of First Nations children being removed from their families and young people and adults in prison. It breaks my heart as a mother and as a human being that almost 19,000 First Nations children are currently removed from their families, 11 times the rate for non-Indigenous children. The violence that I speak of is inherent in our systems that are still taking babies away from their families. The systemic failure that ensures ever more First Nations people are being imprisoned and the structural inequalities that push people to the brink. From 2016 to 2019, almost a quarter of deaths in young First Nations people were by suicide. First Nations young people and children are constantly told to be resilient it's actually not anyone's job to tell First Nations people to be resilient. They know what resilience in the face of colonial oppression looks like. But Mr. Morrison, it is your job to upend the systems that continue to perpetuate injustices against First Nations people. You've only come to the table as reparations to stolen generations after hundreds of survivors said that they would sue the federal government for compensation. It's still too little and too late. The racist harm and violence caused to people through stolen generations cannot even begin to be addressed by the insufficient reparations that have been announced by this government. First Nations disadvantage results in their shorter life expectancy and poorer health. They are disproportionately overrepresented in prisons. It's been 30 years since the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths and Custody, yet we are still in a horrific place where ever more First Nations people are dying in police custody. Almost 500 First Nations people have died in custody since the Royal Commission. If this isn't a call to change the system, then I don't know what is. In his address, Mr. Morrison never once mentioned climate justice. We know that remote communities and people connected to the land are most affected by the climate emergency we're in. Two centuries of colonization have wrecked the millennia of care of country by First Nations people. There can be no environmental justice without First Nations justice. The target set for reducing imprisonment for First Nations people is also so utterly inadequate. And there is no immediate new funding to support the government. And this needs to be addressed. This government and their predecessors have tinkered around the edges, but have never committed to what grassroots First Nations people have been demanding for years, for decades. Put First Nations communities at the grassroots level in the driving seat and fully fund their work. Commit to and start a process for treaties. That will be a start towards the healing and justice that is so needed in this country. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Uh, Senator Rice remotely, Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. Um, I'm 
very pleased to be able to speak to this Closing the Gap statement today because Closing the Gap with our First Nations peoples is such a fundamental thing that we need to address in Australian society. I want to acknowledge that I am speaking today from the um, lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation from my office here in Brunswick. I want to acknowledge the elders past and present and I want to acknowledge all First Nations peoples all around the country. I want to acknowledge that the land that we're all on is sovereign Aboriginal land. It always was, it always will be Aboriginal land. I also want to acknowledge the First Nations peoples that I am very proud to be able to share the, the Senate with Senator, my colleague, Senator Lydia Thorpe, Senator Marlon Deary McCarthy, Senator Pat Dodson and, and Senator Jackie Lambie. I'm very aware that I am speaking to this um, today as a person with immense privilege. I had the privilege of having always had a roof over my head, of good health, of good education, very confident of my own abilities. I've never experienced, as a white person, never experienced racism. I haven't been, the, I haven't experienced intergenerational trauma. And I can only imagine and empathise with people who haven't had the same privilege and commit to using my privilege to be working alongside First Nations peoples for justice. I am a product of the settler colonialist project that is Australia. I live on stolen land. I work on stolen land. Australia was violently wrested from First Nations peoples who had lived here for 60,000 years or more. People were massacred, they were poisoned, food systems and life support systems ripped apart, destroyed, and culture and families ripped apart and destroyed. And the very existence of our First Nations peoples was denied through the concept of terra nullius. And when I was growing up, my understanding of the First Peoples of this land and the First Nations of this country was extraordinarily limited. The culture that I grew up in, which still pervades mainstream Australian culture today, is that First Nations peoples were basically peripheral to mainstream Australia. They were primitive peoples living in the outback or fringe dwellers on the edge of towns and that there was a process of assimilation going on, that we whites were superior and that eventually they, the blacks, would assimilate with us and become like us. And I now know just how wrong and how damaging and how destructive these mainstream cultural attitudes were and still are to our First Nations peoples. I find it extraordinary to think that it's only in my lifetime that the first peoples of this country were finally recognised as citizens of Australia. And at the time that I was born, First Nations peoples, First Nations babies were being taken from their parents. They were being taken from their community, their culture, their language. They were stolen from their parents, their community, their culture and their language. And they were being fostered with nice white families like mine or corralled into children's homes that did their best to destructively hammer their blackness out of them. This is Australia's violent history of dispossession, and it's ongoing. The number of First Nations peoples in custody, the suicide rates, the early deaths, the child removals, and the massive numbers of First Nations peoples, including children who are brutally imprisoned, and the deaths in custody show that this history of dispossession is still an ongoing present reality. The huge gaps between First Nations peoples and the rest of us shows that this is the case, that we are still a colonial country and our, our First Nations peoples are still treated as second-class citizens by most peoples in this country. And there is still racism against our First Nations peoples, that is still rife in our community, as Senator Hanson's contribution this morning made clear. And we are never going to close the gap unless we acknowledge that this is our reality and that we acknowledge our history and acknowledge the ongoing justices in Australian society. We will never close the gap until we can tell the truth and then move on together. I mean, we cannot undo the past. The past has occurred. We are now a multicultural community of over 25 million people here in Australia. 
But what we need to do is to acknowledge the truth, to acknowledge the dispossession, the trauma, and then commit ourselves to be making amends. And while we are still celebrating Australia Day, instead of acknowledging it as Invasion Day or Survival Day, while mainstream Australian culture doesn't acknowledge this truth, doesn't acknowledge that we are living on stolen land, doesn't commit to a process of decolonising and doesn't acknowledge the underlying racism that pervades our country, we are not going to close the gap. And we are never going to close the gap until we have leadership that commits to decolonising, that commits to truth-telling, that commits to treaties, to genuine self-determination by First Nations peoples rather than ongoing neo-colonial control. And we need late leadership that acknowledges the racism that is still rife in our communities. And leadership that then says, we need powerful anti-racism strategies to address it. We need leadership that commits to protecting country and to be genuinely consulting with, listening to, and not overriding the wishes of First Nations peoples. Leadership that actually is First Nations peoples alongside other peoples. And, so, and to be managing country hand in hand with our First Nations peoples. And for example, to be not proceeding with fracking vast tracts of unceded land in the Northern Territory without consent. We need to be protecting our precious forests and their wildlife rather than destroying them out without consent. We need to be taking urgent, serious action to be slashing our carbon pollution to zero so that we can have climate justice, so that can be racial justice as well. Be protecting country, be protecting our future, be making sure that we have got a safe climate for all of us to be, to be living in. We need to be protecting the web of life, to be respecting, respecting and nurturing the entanglement of relationships between every living creature and every part of the world that we are part of. And we have to do this for all of our sakes, for Australia's sake. We can never be at peace with ourselves or the country until we do. All of us have got so much to gain by truly acknowledging and valuing our First Nations peoples as First Peoples, who are the traditional owners, owners and custodianship custodians of this, all of this land and who maintain that ownership and custodianship of the land. We can learn, we can listen, we can embrace wisdom and knowledge and commit to protecting country. We can celebrate culture and then work powerfully and creatively together in our evolving shared culture together, proudly rather than hypocritically. And it's only by doing that that reconciliation with our First Nations peoples can become a reality and that we will truly be on the journey to closing the gaps that are currently impacting so harmfully on all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Pratt. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. This morning, at the outset of this speech, I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land our parliament meets on today, the Ngunnawal people, as well as the traditional owners of Perth, where I hail from, and the Wadjuk people within the Noongar Nation, as well as all of the wonderful First Nations nations of Western Australia. And it is a great honour to be a representative uh, in this place, working alongside the likes of um, Senator Pat Dodson, to be a representative for those people and communities in this place. As we all know, we have a long road to closing the gap <clears throat> in life experiences, life expectancy, social health and economic outcomes for First Nations people. Uh, here in Australia. But today I want to talk about a different gap, a gap that when we address it makes such a critical difference to closing these other gaps, the gaps that have been outlined in the Closing the Gap statement, on all those health and social outcomes. But it also closes a gap for all of us 
as Australians. And that is the importance of our nation celebrating, learning about, resourcing and respecting First Nations culture and people. And how much we still have to learn about doing that, because we've come some way and a long way, but not nearly far enough. And it's evident in our cultural institutions, in our schools and our communities. And the, I really want to lay on the record that we're all the poorer uh, as a country for not having done enough of that. And I include in that the importance of the implementation of the Uluru Statement from the Heart. So as I reflect on my own life as an Australian, I remember the 1979, I think it was, 150th centenary of the so-called foundation of Western Australia by British colonists, the celebrations at school, the reenactments, and I recall them very vividly, and they were all done with blindness, as far as I could see um, from my child's eyes, to the many First Nations people of Western Australia, or the frontier wars and massacres that took place across the state. I would spend my own childhood holidays at Rottnest Island, ignorant at the time to the fact that it was a place of misery, slavery and incarceration, a place of chains and death for many hundreds of First Nations men from around the state. And I recall the common parlance of appalling racist language across the community and in the playground. So as a background to my um, childhood and growing up, uh, I finally learned of the ongoing structural marginalisation of First Nations people in a real sense in my home state uh, when I went to university at UWA. I knew of this in my heart, but I'd never really had a chance to learn about it. I spent some time studying African history uh, at, the end of a, uh, at about the same time as the end of apartheid. So in the and, you know, this was in the 1990s. I learned about the restrictions of South African people's movement, their removal from whole homelands, the law requiring them to have papers to go anywhere, the stealing of wages, the stealing of children and so on. What I also learned was that the many laws of South Africa that were still evident uh, at the time of apartheid, the laws that I had studied had been copied from my own home state of Western Australia. So with my eyes peeled back anew, I could see the many layers of this legacy etched into the daily life for First Nations people in my home state and indeed for all of its citizens whether it's in the remote communities of the Kimberley or in um, the strong First Nations communities in the Wheat Belt, where they've nevertheless all been dispossessed from their country uh, in the process of clearing and agricultural. Um, so with my eyes peeled back anew, I uh, have had the chance to reflect now, you know, for the last 30 years, on how far we've come and what we have learned from First Nations communities. And it, was, it is with the deepest heartfelt sense that I say today how much richer my own life is as an Australian for the opportunity to share in First Nations culture and the many diverse local cultures from my own, own home state of WA. I believe fervently in what First Nations of people achieved in coming together with the Uluru Statement from the Heart. I have no fear of its implementation, and I really do not understand why this government has sought to block its aspirations. Its implementation can only do great good for our nation. And as that statement said, it said, with substantive constitutional change 
and structural reform, we believe this ancient sovereignty can shine through as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. And I believe very much that all Australians have a great deal to gain and benefit uh, from the expression of that constitutional change and structural reform, including in the way that we debate issues and listen in this place. I don't see constitutional recognition and indeed a voice to parliament as a controversial or difficult thing. After all, it is the job of this place and through our Senate committees to listen to the voice of all Australians. And so it should appear simple enough that in the same way that we have a parliamentary joint committee for corporations or a redress committee or an economics committee, that we're able to have an approach and a committee that listens to First Nations people on their terms and utilises their cultural paradigms as we do that. It's done in plenty of other parliaments around the country. I mean, uh, around the country, but also very much around the world. West, in Western Australia, I have to say, in touching on the Uluru Statement, we know that Western Australia has almost as many First Nation people in our prisons as Victoria, which is pretty astounding when you consider the uh, difference in our population size. So I want to very much also endorse uh, the principle of Makarata so that we can come to terms uh, as a nation with our future and reflect on our colonial history and the frontier wars and people, First Peoples Nation uh, struggles in that regard. And in that context, I want to commend the recent production of York uh, in, uh, that, that I recently saw uh, in Perth at the Heath Ledger Theatre. And as I reflect on what the Greens were just saying uh, in this debate, I want to reflect that we can't hector the rest of the country into this, but we can really embrace the notion that we all have so much to gain in uh, the full expression of ourselves as a nation. I see this in my six-year-old son as he takes pride, curiosity and joy in learning about First Nations culture uh, at his own school in reading their stories. And it is a far cry from my own childhood and a real reflection of the future I hope we can all achieve as a nation. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Mariel Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I begin by acknowledging that, as I give this contribution remotely, I do so from the lands of the Ghana people, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. As a South Australian Senator, I also acknowledge the 39 Aboriginal language groups that make up the state I represent as a Senator. I pay tribute to Senators Dodson, Senator McCarthy, Senator Lambie and Senator Thorpe, as well as Minister Wyatt and Shadow Minister Burney in the other place. And I reaffirm my commitment to voice, treaty and truth. On the whole, this year's Closing the Gap data makes for difficult reading. Of the targets that have been set aimed at addressing Indigenous disadvantage, only three are on track. Children born healthy and strong, preschool and uh, youth detention. Closing the gap is an area of public policy where a spirit of bipartisan commitment is crucial. And I acknowledge all senators in this chamber who share that commitment genuinely. But taking a bipartisan approach doesn't mean avoiding appropriate scrutiny. Indeed, it is only continuous scrutiny and accountability that will pave the path to change that we so desperately need to see. Two years ago, the government said they would change the approach to closing the gap in partnership with peak First Nations organisations. 
As Anthony Albanese has done, I acknowledge the role played by Pat Turner and the coalition of peaks in this work. But we still don't have data or a measurement of progress on the four priority reforms. Some of the targets lack serious ambition. We should not and cannot settle simply for improving the lives of our First Nations people while maintaining stark inequalities between First Nations and non-Indigenous Australians. Of the closing the gap targets that we don't have data to measure progress for, this is deeply concerning because every one of the closing the gap targets is important. From ensuring families and households are safe to ensuring youth are engaged in employment and education and making sure First Nations Australians are empowered to maintain their distinctive cultural, spiritual, physical and economic relationship with the country. All deserve our full support and determination, and we must recommit to removing racial discrimination and disadvantage across all areas of our society. There is a glimmer of hope in some of this year's data, because one target which the data shows we are on track to reach is an absolutely crucial one for all of our futures. And that is to ensure that children are engaged in high quality, culturally appropriate early childhood education in their early years. This target is for the proportion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children enrolled in year before full-time schooling, early childhood education to reach 95% by 2025. Data from the Productivity Commission estimates that based on 93.1% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in the age cohort being enrolled in a preschool program, that target will be met by 2025. Our long-term efforts towards closing the gap require getting early childhood education right. We know that it is in the first thousand days of a child's life where critical brain connections are formed. And during these first thousand days, children need the opportunity to develop well, to access the all important fundamentals of play-based learning, nutrition and nurture. Early education can play a role in ensuring these fundamentals are met for all Australian children. And for children experiencing disadvantage, it is especially important that we get this right. Of course, this must be done in support of families and in support of the irreplaceable and most essential relationship between children and their families. Let us never forget the disastrous policy failures that have come out of this place to achieve the very opposite. Let us never forget that it was only 13 years ago that we gathered here in this place to finally say sorry to the stolen generations. While there is better news in this year's Closing the Gap report around early childhood education enrolment rates, there of course remains so much work to do. It is of some comfort that the outcome area of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children being born healthy and strong, which aims to increase the proportion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander babies with a healthy birth weight to 91% by 2031, is also on track, subject to caveats. But if we are to truly give all Australian children the best possible start in life, we have to make much more progress on issues such as the devastating overrepresentation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in the child protection system. This year's figures show us we are a long, long way from any meaningful progress on this issue. In fact, the number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in the system increased from 2019 to 2020. In my state of South Australia, rates of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids in the system are almost 12 times that of non-Indigenous kids. Just think about that, what that means, what that statistic means, because whatever the individual circumstances that underpin that statistic, it should move all of us to tackle the disadvantage faced by First Nations people in every aspect of life, the disadvantage and the discrimination. When it comes to levels of social and emotional well-being, we are not on track to meet the target of a significant and sustained reduction in suicide for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. That represents far too many unbearable losses for far too many families. And tragically, we were reminded earlier this year on the 30th anniversary of the handing down of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody in April that more than 470 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have died in custody since 1991. So much work to do. There is so much work to do. And although these words can feel hollow, having been uttered so many times in this place, the time for announcements and for promises is long past. Labor is committed to closing the gap. We are determined to seeing it through. And I'm proud to be a party from a party that shares that genuine commitment 
Labor believes every Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander child must grow up with the same opportunities as those of non-Indigenous children. That's a right of all Australian children. Labor has a plan to turn the tide on incarceration and deaths in custody by building on the proven success of justice reinvestment programs which address the root causes of crime, including rehabilitation services, family or domestic violence support, homelessness support and school retention initiatives. Labor will provide specific standalone funding for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services to ensure First Nations people can access culturally sensitive supports when they need them. And we also know that as crucial as the tangible measures that underpin closing the gap are to improving the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are, we also have a duty, an enormous duty and responsibility to fully embrace the Uluru Statement from the heart. Voice, treaty, truth. Labor's commitment to Uluru is solid. Our commitment is to the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution to take a rightful place for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians to take a rightful place in their own country as it was put. And a voice must be coupled with a Makarata Commission with responsibility for truth telling and for treaty. We must fully reckon with our past so we can walk together towards a more equal future. In closing, I want to acknowledge and associate myself with the earlier contributions of Senators McCarthy and Dodson and disassociate myself in the strongest terms with the contribution of Senator Hanson, which was offensive, hurtful and divisive. There's no place for it here or indeed anywhere in Australia. I am, as a Senator and as a human being, committed to listening more, learning more from our First Nations Australians striving to do better, striving to do better by them, by our history, and striving to be part of a better future. And I would urge all senators to do the same. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I acknowledge all people of our nation. Earlier this month, I returned from more than two weeks listening to the people on the ground in all communities across Cape York, Communities like Cohen, Laura, Lockhart River, Port Stewart, Bamaga, Seisha, Umagico, Ingenu, New Mapoon, Thursday Island, Sabai Island, Badu Island, Weeper, Mapoon, Napranam, Arakoon, Pomparau, Kawanyama. That follows previous visits to Cape communities, to Northern Territory Aboriginal communities and Aboriginal community gatherings in Southern Queensland. So I now turn my comments to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. I acknowledge people like Warren Mundine, Jacintha Price, Jacintha Priscilla Rose Geyer, who has taken responsibility for her life and recently graduated from university after battling with domestic violence. I acknowledge Bruce Gibson, Hopevale business owner and a leader on the Cape. I acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in the NRL and the AFL, whose participation at elite levels of their sports exceed their proportion in the general population of all Australians. Aboriginals and Islanders are excelling in this country at times, just like other members of the community. And I acknowledge and wholeheartedly endorse Senator Pauline Hanson's speech and comments earlier this morning. Now, I'm no expert on Aboriginal and Islander matters, yet I am a human, and I know what I see in any community, regardless of race, colour, religion. Let me share some insights because what is happening on the ground in Cape York is some exciting new improvements, yet a perpetuation of the misery and squalor that for too long has characterised some Aboriginal communities. First topic, native title. Recognition of previous occupancy is needed. White and black people on the Cape speak with a common voice saying that, it has added, that native title has added another layer to negotiations for development, and people largely accept that. What is not accepted is the inability of Aboriginal people to have rights to use their land due to the Native Title Act. A quote from a member of my staff who visited with, uh, with me on the Cape. An unusual feature found in the preamble to the Native Title Act is the significant overemphasis on the influence of United Nations principles which do nothing to tangibly benefit Australia's Indigenous people. The Native Title Act, as told to me by Indigenous leaders and community members, is recognition 
recognition, but otherwise offers little more than window dressing. It is hindering Indigenous people from advancing their interests in our society. Aboriginals are not able to achieve ownership of their own homes if the area falls into a native title. It's hurting the very people it was meant to serve. But I, maybe the meaning is beyond the Aboriginals and the whites in this country and has everything to do with the United Nations. Locking up land. What is the point, the Aboriginal leaders and members of the community say, to having native title when Aboriginals lack the rights to use the land, when Aboriginals cannot use it as collateral for starting a business? Next one, closing the gap. In my experience, we tend to achieve that on which we focus. Instead of focusing on a gap that will, that will perpetuate the gap, we need to focus on standards applicable and expected in every community and measure progress toward that. A prominent islander who earned my respect through our hours of discussion, involved, and he's involved in governance, expressed it well when he said bluntly, that focusing on the gap perpetuates the gap because there is a whole industry that exists only while the gap exists. Those people, consultants, agencies, lawyers, politicians, ministers, exist only because of the gap. They have an interest in perpetuating the gap, and they do perpetuate the gap. The money, authority, power needs to be taken out of the hands of the Aboriginal industry and given to the Aboriginals and Islanders in the communities. This Aboriginal industry, and by the way, Aboriginals use those exact words for the people holding them back. This Aboriginal industry makes money from people's misery and perpetuates the misery. Next point, data and facts. Some in the Aboriginal industry exist because of poor data and a lack of consulting people on the ground in communities. Some exist because they misrepresent the data. Misrepresenting the data, altering the facts, hides the problem and that prevents a suitable, robust solution. When data is accurate, we need to use it in context and convey it accurately. Above all, we need to dig down to the core problem. That's where the opportunities for advancement lay. Those who misrepresent data in the belief that they need to exaggerate the misery to get something done about it, in fact, derail efforts and perpetuate the misery because further they cause further new miseries. For example, deaths in custody tells a story about our whole nation and, and needs to be dug into properly not taken out of context. The core issue on the Cape is shoddy governance, a confusing mishmash of alphabet soup of programs among federal, state and local governments, riddled with waste, duplication and, from what we're told, seems entirely plausible, corruption. As a result, taxpayer money is being wasted. Taxpayers are funding billions of dollars each year on Aboriginal programs, yet only a fraction reaches the Aborigines, Aboriginals and Islanders on the ground in communities. Much is lost in waste, much apparently is stolen or redirected selfishly, as is power, as, is res as are resources and as is control, redirected for personal benefit. We need to improve governance to ensure everyday Aboriginals receive and efficiently use the money and ensure that taxpayers get value for their money. Those funds will be more effective when granted with sound intent, instead of the patronising paternalism we need to, we, instead of that, we need to give more autonomy to those communities to take responsibility. These people in the communities are crying out for authority over their own lives and communities. And I remind the Senate of something I've used many times. Maria Montessori said, whenever one sees a lack of responsibility, there is a lack of freedom. Across the Cape, and to varying degrees, depending upon the community, people are crying out for self-determination. People and communities need self-determination. Australia needs these communities to have self-determination. Aboriginals in many communities are ready for freedom that, because that brings accountability. One further issue needs to be mentioned, past injustice. The murdering of Aboriginals and Islanders, the capricious, heartbreaking stealing of land and destruction of houses, and the fracturing of families and relocations and deaths in large numbers, some as recently as the 1960s is a blight on our history. Yet that is what they are, history. To be remembered, yet not to be used politically, not to foment guilt today. Guilt is a negative energy. And when used to drive, it drives negative consequences ultimately. In some of the communities, 
with some individuals, some groups, we could feel and I acknowledge the deep sorrow, the continuing sadness, the ongoing grief among some Aboriginals and some Islanders. While past injustices to Aboriginals still weigh heavily, the current generation of Australians is not responsible for this. We are, though, responsible for the poor state of governance in state and federal governments. As voters, that is our responsibility. I turn to Indigenous Voice. Only one community said that it was adequately consulted on the Indigenous Voice to Parliament. Others had not even heard of it. Those who did hear of it either reported to us that consultation was shallow and brief or that it was the proposal that the proposal will divide communities. Councillors said, for example, that voice will be for Aboriginals and not for Islanders. And that spurred the thought in them that if Aboriginals have a voice, then Islanders need a voice. But they could see what, that, what was happening, because at its heart, a special voice for a specific group only separates and alienates that group. I want to talk about culture. The first step in assisting Aboriginals to lift communities is to understand the Aboriginal culture. Now, I do not understand many aspects of Aboriginal and Islander culture, yet I can see and know that I do not know and I do not understand the culture. I can see that cultural aspects are crucial for lasting solutions and progress. This is fundamental. It is the arrogance and ignorance in this building that proclaims solutions without understanding culture. And after listening closely to the people across the Cape so recently, I was shocked with the pater patronising paternalism heard in the other chamber last week. Instead of politics denigrating other parties, exaggerating and sometimes falsely misrepresenting the initiative of the Speaker's party, we need to focus on the data, the core issues and solid plans. With unity between state and federal governments that put people's, put, puts people's lives and livelihoods ahead of party politics that is again infecting some of today's speeches. We need to focus on Aboriginal and Islander issues with the intent of freeing these people to be accountable and proud. And that starts with real listening and real understanding and real Thank involvement you, with Roberts, authority. Your time has expired. Senator Green. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, I begin by acknowledging that we meet on the land of the Nuggawal and Nambury people, the traditional owners of the lands which Parliament meet on today. But of course, I'm also calling in from Cairns, the land of the Gungwai, Wulabu, Yinjinji people in far north Queensland. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I also want to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging of the lands of Cape York, Mornington Island and the Torres Strait Islands. I am so lucky to live in this region and to learn from their stories and their spirit. Madam Deputy President, for eight long years, this government has kicked the can down the road on responsibility for and progress on closing the gap. And it's been more than two years since this government said it would change their approach to closing the gap. I fear that this change is in approach only. It isn't a change to make change for change's sake. It's a change to shift responsibility and accountability so that this government can say that they've done something when nothing has been achieved. There has been no measurable progress on the bar this government set themselves on the priority reforms, shared decision making, building community controlled sector, transform, transforming government organisations and shared access to regional data. These are meant to be the backbone of working with First Nations organisations and underpin the path to self-determination. It hasn't moved, but beyond rhetoric. The new targets in Closing the Gap include the social and cultural factors which determine overall health, and this is important. Things like housing, access to services, child protection, family violence, culture and language, and land and water rights. As Anthony Albanese said in his speech in the other place earlier this week, there is no pathway to ensuring First Nations Australians live as long as more as long as healthy lives as non-Indigenous Australians without steadily addressing each of these interconnected targets. 
More than half a year after the new Closing the Gap Agreement was signed, First Nations people are still far more likely to be jailed, die by suicide, have their children removed than non-Indigenous Australians. Out of the 17 targets that have been set, only three are on track. Today I'd like to focus on one of those targets, and that's housing. Target nine of the Closing the Gap Agreement says, by 2031, we need to increase the proportion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people living in appropriately sized, not overcrowded housing to 88%. Indigenous Australians make up 3% of the Australian population, but account for 20% of all persons who were homeless during the last census. Labor has consistently called on the Morrison government to outline a plan to address the severe overcrowding in First Nations communities across Australia. Nationally, in 2016, 78.9% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were living in inappropriately sized housing. This is just what we know through census data. But you don't need data to tell you that this is an important issue. You can see it with your own eyes. And the shocking thing is that we know many ministers of this government, many MPs, many senators who are members of this government have travelled and visited remote and regional communities and they have seen the overcrowding firsthand. The Morrison government knows how important this is and yet the Prime Minister takes no responsibility for this target. I was disappointed but not surprised to discover last week after the Closing the Gap speech was delivered that there is not a single new cent for funding for housing in remote Indigenous communities in this country. No new funding for the Northern Territory, none for Western Australia, and none for far North Queensland, the Cape or the Torres Strait. There are no details about how this Morrison government will achieve this target. And what the COVID pandemic has shown us is that housing is crucial to health and wellbeing. You can't isolate from coronavirus if you don't have adequate housing. And you cannot live a healthy and meaningful life unless you have the appropriate housing that you need. It is a crucial first step to supporting the health and economic outcomes of First Nations communities. What good is this government's empty promises for a better future for First Nations people when there literally aren't enough houses to go around? In 2018, the coalition government walked away from the National Partnership Agreement on Remote Housing. This was a 10-year agreement which saw the Commonwealth Government under Prime Minister Kevin Rudd commit $5.5 billion over 10 years to address shocking levels of overcrowding and poor housing conditions in remote communities. Prime Minister Turnbull and then Treasurer Scott Morrison walked away from this agreement. Mr Morrison refused to recommit to the partnership when he became Prime Minister. Instead, in the lead up to the last election, the Morrison government did what it has always done, made an announcement. They announced a one-off payment of $105 million, such a drop in the ocean compared to the 10-year funding agreement. And this funding would uh, be for communities in the Cape York and Torres Strait but when you break it down, would equate to only four to five houses for each community. This announcement was made by Warren Ench and Nigel Scullion, uh, the former Indigenous Affairs Minister. And it, it led to a lot of people believing that this was a short-term solution, but there would be an announcement from this government in future budgets. Well, there hasn't been any further announcement. There is no funding and the $105 million, well, not a single house has been built with that funding. We know that overcrowding is getting worse while this government sits on its hands. But instead of doing anything about this, uh, the local member for Leichhardt, Warren Inch, told the ABC that he doesn't hold a building licence. That was his excuse for not getting these houses built or delivering any future funding for this basic right for Indigenous communities. The government should be investing in social housing and in Indigenous housing. It's a win-win for our country, for the health and well-being of Indigenous Australians, but also to create jobs and to make sure that we've got training and apprenticeship opportunities for young people in communities. We know that's exactly what a Labor government will do if elected. 
Anthony Albanese has already announced that under a $10 billion social housing fund to build 30,000 affordable housings, $200 million of that fund will go to repair and maintain housing in remote Indigenous communities. I was so proud when that announcement was made. And yet, during the Closing the Gap speech that the Prime Minister made last week and his press conference, where he appeared to shout and, and, um, and rant at uh, journalists, about this process, we heard nothing from the Prime Minister about remote and Indigenous housing. We know that there is a need to deliver the Uluru Statement, and it, and it comes back to truth-telling uh, truth and treaty-making. But we need to tell the truth about what's happening right now. We have babies living in houses with 20 other people in remote communities in regional and remote Queensland. And there cannot be a situation where Australians think that that is acceptable, where a minister in this government could visit a community like that and leave not wanting to fix Have we got the list yet, guys? We do need to fix this. We need to fix this straight away. This is not something that can wait for an election announcement, for the Prime Minister to need something to announce to uh, help himself in the polls. This is something that should be done because it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do to fix overcrowding in our communities. It is a target in the Closing the Gap, but there's no funding from this government. And every time they get up in this chamber and they speak about Closing the Gap and all of the things that they are doing and the way that they're working with First Nations communities, I can't help but think that none of these achievements will actually have any impact unless we fix housing first. Housing is a basic human right, and our First Nations communities deserve the dignity of a good home, a house to live in, somewhere to raise their family, a place to come back to at the end of the day. They deserve to have these homes on their country, uh, where their cultural ancestors started their lives and where their lives will end one day. Thank you, Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Green. I'm just not sure where that interference is coming from. I just heard it again. Just, I'm assuming it's all OK. Um, Senator Polly, I do remind you we've got a hard marker at 12.15, but Senator Polly. Thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. I begin by acknowledging the Palawa people, traditional custodians of the land on which I am streaming from today respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. For eight long years, the government has shifted from its responsibility in progressing closing the gap, deflecting it to the states and territories and leaving it up to the future cohorts. It has been more than a year since the new closing the gap agreement was signed and the First Nations people still have significant higher incarceration rates, are more likely to die by suicide, have their children removed from non-Indigenous, more than non-Indigenous Australians. These are statistics that we should not be comfortable with. Disappointingly, only three out of the 17 targets are on track to achieve being achieved. There's also no measurement on the progress of the four priority reforms which aim to change the way governments work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and are designed to strengthen their culture. These include shared decision making, building the community control sector, transforming government organisations and shared access to regional data. These reforms are meant to be the pillars for working with First Nation organisations and support the path to self-determination. I'm concerned that these have not moved beyond discussion. These are real commitments and political will will improve all 17 targets and bring Australia in line with closing the gap. We need sustainable leadership and meaningful reform. We do welcome the additional funding announced by the Prime Minister last week, but he has also clearly walked away from any impeding implementing a voice to the Parliament. This is despite the fact at the beginning of his term, it was alleged, allegedly high on his agenda. Now there is no hope that the Liberals will even get a legislative voice to the Parliament before the next election. As, as with always, Mr Morrison promises a lot but fails to deliver. There clearly 
against the enshrined voice that is being called for by the Uluru Statement. The Prime Minister also promised a new approach, and we welcome that. But previous history causes us to question this. Is this new money he has announced, or is this another rehashed announcement full of spin? This is a government that never follows through, and this is something that is too important to miss the mark on. As we stand, Australians have done a great job at protecting Indigenous communities from the spread of COVID-19. However, there is currently limited data available on vaccination rates in Indigenous communities. It's important to ensure that a comprehensive data is collected so that vulnerable communities do not fall through the gap. Despite Indigenous people aged 55 and over being classified as a 1B priority group since late March this year, and Indigenous people aged 16 and over since June, vaccination rates are very low. According to data obtained from The Guardian from the Department of Health, approximately 24% of eligible population of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders have been vaccinated, and just over 10% of the eligible population has been fully vaccinated. This compares with 44% of the general population aged 16 and over who have received at least one dose and 7.7% of the general population who are fully vaccinated. The fourth priority reform under the National Agreement on Closing the Gap is shared access to data and information at a regional level. If we are to implement this reform and improve the health outcomes of Indigenous Australians, we need a higher level of detail in the data of vaccination rates. These priority reforms need to move from being rhetoric to action. In the short term, to ensure that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities are safe from the threat of COVID-19, to improving longer term health outcomes so that they live as long and as healthily lives as non-Indigenous Australians. The targets set out by the National Agreement must be addressed holistically as each of the targets are interconnected. The Morrison government must ensure that they lift their game so that more than three indicators are on track. Labor's plan to close the gap will take action to address inequality through policies that strengthen First Nations economic and job opportunities. The First Nations population is young and rapidly growing, and there will be a surge in the number who will be joining working age population in the coming years. Having a job bolsters our economic independence and is crucial to determining our well-being. All Australians should be able to have the opportunity to share in Australia's good fortune. However, currently First Nation Australians have significantly lower rates of employment, workforce participation and higher rates of unemployment. To improve the economic and job opportunities of First Nations people, Labor will double the number of rangers by the end of the decade to 3,800 to help protect and restore both our biodiversity and our cultural values. The Indigenous Rangers program will provide valuable employment for Indigenous people in regional and rural communities, maintains connection to country, grows local economies and protects and restores the environment. As part of this program, funding for Indigenous protected areas will also receive a boost of additional $10 million each year to improve biosecurity, biodiversity and managing cultural sites and Labor will deliver the $40 million of cultural water promised in 2018, but not yet delivered by the Morrison government. To improve employment opportunities on another front, Labor will also set a target to increase First Nations employment in the Australian public service to 5% by 2030. In the private sector, Labor will support the continuing work of some of Australia's largest employers in increasing the rate of First Nation employment. To prevent the ripping off of the First Nations arts and crafts, which rob Thank Indigenous you, artists Polly. of their income. You will now be in continuation. I shall now proceed to Senators